Good morning, the Executive Governor of Cardinal State. Good morning, members of the PCT. Good morning, my distinguished colleagues. For two days last month, Thursday, January 20, and Friday, January 21, President Muhammadu Buhari was in Cardinal State on an official visit. At the end of this trip, President Buhari said, and I quote, I can hardly find my way in Kaduna due to the development taking place here. And the governor has committed himself to change Kaduna for good and has been very successful at that. And Nigerians are appreciative that you are writing your history in letters of gold. I am pleased to be associated with your successes and initiatives. He also said, I've been most impressed by the consistent efforts of the Cardinal State Government to develop the state, to seek progress on so many fronts, and to boldly confront challenges. This morning, the President's host at that time the executive governor of Cardinal State. He does not need to call himself a servant leader. He doesn't need to call himself Mr. Project. His reputation simply precedes him. He's Malam Nasser El Rufai, and he's our guest this morning at the special weekly briefing coordinated by the presidential communications team. He will brief the stakeholders of this platform on the current status of internal security and economic strides in Cardona State. He will also provide updates on key collaborations between the federal and state governments, especially on efforts to ta tackle the menace of banditry and terrorism in the Northwest region. He is there with his team I'm sure when he begins to talk, he will introduce members of his team. So on this note, I would like to invite the Executive Governor of Cardinal State to please take the podium for about 20 minutes, after which we'll take questions from our speakers. So is yours, sir. Yes, sir. Your Excellency, my elder brother Ambarewa Senior, Malam Garba Shehu, um, my colleagues on the Kaduna State Government side, Samuel Arwan is our Commissioner Internal Security and Home Affairs. Mariam Abubakar is a Senior Special Assistant Intergovernmental Relations in our liaison office here. Uh, I apologize that we we are running a little late. We met some bad traffic uh, along the Buari axis. So our special assist, uh, advisor, media and communications, Muyua Adeke, is doing his COVID test to join us. He will join us shortly by the grace of God. Uh, the presidential communications team, uh, gentlemen of the press, my sister Loretta, you can see they are sitting on this side. Uh, it is my pleasure to stand before you to give you a very quick briefing about how we are doing our best to register some progress in spite of the security challenges in Kaduna State. Uh, my presentation will be in two parts. I will first start with the internal security situation and what we're doing about it and how the state and the federal government are collaborating to bring an end to it and the issues in Kaduna are symptomatic of all the problems in the Northwest. Um, and uh, the second part will look at what we've been trying to do in Kaduna. Um, and the most interesting part for me will be when you ask your questions, because I will try to go through the slides. There are about 60 slides and a few videos that I would like to show you. I'll try to zip through that in 20 minutes. Uh, or slightly more, 
uh, so that we have more time for questions and answers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the first part is on the security challenges. Uh, now, next slide, please. I don't know. Yeah. Now, when we came into office in 2015, and this is what many people forget, uh, there were security challenges. It wasn't like uh, everything was peaceful and quiet. Uh, but in the Northwest, in Kaduna, what we had then, our major problem was cattle rustling. Um, and the an armed robbery. There were some instances of kidnapping, but it was something we hear about in other places. And then we had urban gangs, you know, this... Uh, young people that take drugs and clash, uh, similar to cultism. Uh, we have those in Kaduna town. And then, of course, the perennial problem of ethno-religious clashes, uh, which have been part of Kaduna's history since 1980. Uh, statewide lockdown, statewide curfews due to uh, ethnic and religious uh, uh, clashes. Uh, so those were the challenges that we inherited. But by 2017, um, these challenges have evolved. We have we addressed some, and some new ones emerged. Uh, banditry is now the biggest problem. Rural banditry, mostly in the rural areas and in the forests. Uh, cattle rustling, still a bit of it, not like before, but uh, still a problem. And then kidnapping within communities and on highways, and then violent attacks and reprisals. So we still have some communal clashes, but not on a statewide basis, you know, on small communities, maximum one local government uh, uh, at a time, unlike before when you know, the problem used to engulf the entire state. So there has been some progress. Next slide. Uh, so where we are now is that kidnapping, cattle rustling, uh, random attacks by bandits uh, on schools, farms, communities uh, are the biggest problems. And all parts of the state are affected. Um, in some parts of the state, in southern Kaduna, for instance, where there are about 50 different ethnic groups, uh, this terrorism is also taking a religious and ethnic uh, tone, uh, but really it is the same people in every part of the state doing this, but in southern Kaduna because of the ethnic and religious mix, it is uh, some people are trying to ex ex you know, exploit the fault lines, uh, but really it's just criminality, yeah, pure and simple. Next slide. So we have insecurity around banditry in all the seven states of the Northwest. It's just a matter of degree. Uh, Jigawa doesn't have any forests, so they don't have much of cattle rustling and kidnapping. Uh, Kano has only one forest, Falgore, in border with Kaduna, so they have a bit of cattle rustling uh, and banditry. But Sokoto, Kebi, Zamfara, Kaduna, Katsina have and Niger share a forest range that stretches from Niger State up to Niger Republic. And this is the major source, this is the major route that the bandits use. They know these forests very well, and they use them to move from state to state and, uh, uh, and attack communities. Um, so five states in the Northwest are badly afflicted by this, plus Niger State, because of the contiguity of the forest ranges. Um, but, and indeed, you know, the problems of banditry are far more serious in Zamfara and Kasina states historically than they have ever been in Kaduna state. But of course, I mean, Zamfara, Kasina are village states, I would like to say. While Kaduna is a cosmopolitan state, all the media are there and so on and so forth. So, you know, more of what happens in Kaduna gets reported because of, where we, because of who we are and where we are. But this is a major problem across the five states of the Northwest and, uh, and, and, state and all the media and, and, and Niger state are there and so on. But and so what is even uh, worrying for us in the last one year 
is that there is a growing integration and collaboration between these bandits and Boko Haram and another group called Ansaru. They are also terrorists like Boko Haram, similar ideology, but uh, they are on targets, uh, government officials, security agencies, and so on. Um, so increasingly, the banditry is taking the guise of terrorism because bandits uh, are driven by economics, not ideology. They kidnap for ransom. They, you know, they, they are out to make money but they have no ideology. Most of them have no religion, actually. But now it is looking like Boko Haram elements have infiltrated the bandits, so you see things like burning uh, communities, which bandits don't usually do. Uh, they, they prefer money than anything. So that is uh, another uh, major issue of concern. Now, one of the things that we started doing in Kaduna State, which we, uh, I want to say we are the only government doing it in Nigeria, is publishing uh, quarterly crime statistics. Instances of kidnapping, armed robbery, everything. We publish, we brief people, and we started doing that because there were lots of false narratives about what was going on. For instance, you know, um, we know from the security reports we get and from where we deploy security forces, we know where we have the highest incidences of kidnapping, murder, armed robbery, everything. But what is reported by the media is that Southern Kaduna is the only uh, problem of Kaduna State. In fact, Southern Kaduna is not the most unsafe place in Kaduna as the statistics I will present will show. So we started this from 2020, because we noticed that some were using politics and to further divide the people, so we said we'll be compiling the statistics and every quarter our commissioner briefs uh, stakeholders and the media and brings out the figures. Um, and when we started doing that, those that were passing wrong information started complaining that we are revealing security information. Uh, there is nothing classified about uh, admitting that 1,192 of your citizens were killed in 2021, this is the number of people kidnapped, these are the number of people injured, these are the uh, records of animals rustled. And these are documented. So perhaps, you know, there are even more incidences than these that have not been reported to security agencies because not every kidnapping case goes to the security agencies. Some just quietly pay and get their relations back. And we've, the next slide shows these incidents by senatorial district, just so that uh, people will have a flavor of, the, of how it is. You can see that the northern senatorial district, which is Zaria area and so on, has the lowest uh, incidences, about 5% of the incidences of uh, banditry and so on. Um, these are deaths, 66 deaths. Kaduna Central, which is Kaduna, Birnungwari, Chukun, you know, Kaduna Metropolitan, around Kaduna Central Senatorial District, is the senatorial district with 60% of all the uh, incidences. So that's the most unsafe place. And these are the local government, Birnungwari, Chukun, Giwa, Igabi, Kaduna North, Kaduna South, and Kajuru. Southern Kaduna, for instance, uh, popularly so-called, we call it Kaduna South Senatorial District, has 34% of the cases. So Southern Kaduna is not the, 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 the place with the highest insecurity in the state. It's actually Kaduna Central. Uh, and the, 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 these numbers prove it. What about kidnapping? Again, uh, look at kidnapping. North is 5%. Central is 83%. 82.77. And South is 11-12%. Uh, Next slide will show the uh, victims injured. Again, similar pattern. Next slide. This is rustling. Even with rustling, 
most of it is in Kaduna Central. Um, so, as I said, we started this in 2020. These are the 2021 figures. Let me now show you the 2020 figures. These are the 2020 figures. Okay. You can see that everything is getting worse, where more people are getting killed, uh, more citizens are getting kidnapped, and more animals are rustled compared to 2020. So in spite of the military operations and everything, this thing has, this banditry has become a business. It's an industry. And it requires major, major intervention to bring it to, uh, down. These are the numbers. Again, the same pattern. These are the victims, people killed. You can see, again, Kaduna Central accounts for 66%. Southern Kaduna accounts for uh, uh, about 30%. Next slide. This is kidnapping. Again, Kaduna Central, 79%. The rest of the state, the balance. Rostley, again, Kaduna Central, 78%. Next slide. Sorry. So these are the statistics, and uh, you know, of course, you'll get this slide, so you'll have uh, the benefit of looking at this. But, but so, but people always say nothing is being done. Why are things getting worse? Things are getting worse because, as I said, this thing has evolved into a business. And in our view, our approach to the to addressing the problem has been uncoordinated. Okay. Even amongst us governors, there were some that felt that you could make peace with these criminals. Some of us, from day one, Kaduna State's position was, you know, the only good bandit is a dead one. But some of my colleagues, genuinely, like the governor of Kasina, my elder brother, Governor Mansari, felt that he could do business with them. It was only after he tried and failed that he moved to my side. Okay. The governor of Zamfara also tried. But now we are on the same page. And we are trying to uh, implement a coordinated approach to this, which I will speak about slightly. But these are the actions we've taken. We've taken security very seriously. We have, week, uh, you know, in our first term of office, we have weekly security uh, council meetings on Tuesdays. We, 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 we initially collaborated with, among the Northwest states and Niger. We put money together. We contributed 100 million each to launch a military operation against Kato Rosli. The president was kind enough to instruct the NSA to reimburse us, but we put our own money to fund the operation, and that was what helped kill Kato Rosli. Unfortunately, Kato Rosli metamorphosed into kidnapping. I see this is the nature of security challenges. You solve one, it, it evolves into something else. And we, we launched this operation and that was how we dealt with Kato Roslin, because they were using this forest again. The forests were bombed, there were ground troops and you know, blocking force, and we got tens of thousands of uh, cattle and sheep and returned them to their owners. That's how we degraded them. But what we should have done was to continue. Next slide. You know, the operations were not sustained. When we met again to contribute money to do a second round, because we, we, we said that the operations were going to last for about continuously for about three months, we would have finished these guys then. Some governors backed out because the problem had gone down, but they didn't foresee that unless we finish these people, we decimate 90% of them, they will find something else. And, and this, is, this is how uh, kidnapping now became a problem. As far back as 2017, we saw the danger of this, and we made representation to the federal government to declare these bandits as terrorists. But based on advice, it was said that since they don't have single command and control, the way Boko Haram, Iswap, and terrorists are, it is difficult to declare them insurgents. But I'm happy that, you know, by the ruling of the federal high court, they have now been declared terrorists, so they are fair game. Because the military were afraid of bombing them and then f facing ICC. You know, 
media, civil society, uh, always rise to protect uh, those that are at the receiving end of something, not looking at the victims of those people sometimes. And, the, you know, the, no general wants to retire, and then, you know, you go to the U.S. and they seize, they arrest you and say that, you know, you've... Uh, bombed civilians and so on and so forth. So there was reluctance on the part of the military. But with this d declaration by the Federal High Court now, I think we can, we can, we can, we can uh, go after them. Um, so one of the actions we took in our second term of office was also to create a dedicated Ministry of Internal Security and Home Affairs. In our first term of office, security matters were handled by the Office of the Secretary to the government. Okay? That's where the security vote is. Um, but we decided to create a dedicated ministry because the SSG is very busy. It's like the SGF. It has many, many things to capture its attention, and the issue of security has become such a serious problem for us that we felt we needed a cabinet-level person whose only job is to watch security on a daily and hourly and minute-by-minute -minute basis, and Samuel Arwan has been doing a fantastic job uh, of that. Um, these are the functions of the ministry. I will not uh, go through that. And some of the actions we've taken in collaboration with the federal government, because you have to understand that we have no soldiers. We have no police. We have no air force. We have no navy. Uh, we have, at best, vigilantes. The, uh, we have a vigilance service, which we have now amended their law to allow them to carry arms. But initially, we didn't even think they needed to carry arms. Um, but the federal government has been extremely supportive in providing us with the security assets to be able to do this. This, uh, on Kaduna Birnungwari Road, which is one of the most dangerous roads in Nigeria, and Birnungwari Giwa Igabizaria axis, that you don't write about because you only report kidnapping on Kaduna Abuja Road. But more of these things happen on this areas than even on Kaduna Abuja Road. Kaduna Abuja Road is a very safe road compared to some of these roads. We, you, we have Operation Wild Punch, Operation Badama, Mikey, you have detachments of the Nigerian Army. All these are security assets provided by the federal government to the state. We provide some logistics, but a lot of this burden falls on the federal government. Next slide. On Kaduna Abuja Road, there are three operations going on. There is Thunder Strike, there is Operation Puff Ada. Uh, uh, this Puff Ada, I think, is the police. The police. Uh, Thunder Strike is defense headquarters along with the Air Force, and they even built a helipad at Kateri for quick response. Um, and then there is a response team of the DSS in Mufti that just drive up and down, hoping that someone will try to kidnap one of them. And uh, so. Uh, and, and, and many of these bandits had been, had been neutralized. Uh, many attempted kidnaps, kidnapping operations have been stopped because, you know, we, we listen to these people. We listen to their conversations, you know. I get reports every night, you know, this one is planning to do this. We know. So there are many that could have happened that have been prevented. But, of course, those that have been prevented don't make the news. Uh, but I just want to say, you know, that you know, our security agencies are doing very well. They are doing the best that they can. You, they, you can't prevent everything, but they are really trying. Now, in the Southern Kaduna General Area, where we have a bit of banditry, but more greater risks of ethnic and religious clashes, we have this uh, 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 operations to Operation Safe Heaven, headquartered in Jaws. We have a mobile police squadron in Kafanchan. We bought uh, housing estate, 150 million, and gave it to the police so that they can have a mobile police squadron uh, in Kafanchan after the 2016 crisis that affected Kafanchan and two other local governments. Since then, Kafanchan has been quiet since we had a mobile police squadron. We have Nigerian Navy troops in Kachia, in, in Kujama, in Makali, and we have all this, and troops at Kasua Magani. And, uh, and, and and special forces, you know, and so on. So, as far as Southern Kaduna is concerned, it has been really quiet. Uh, 
other than Zanguan Katav local government where the Katavs and the Fulainis are now at war with each other. Um, even that, I think, has gone down. Uh, and we have Nigerian Air Force Special Forces. Kaduna Airport area had also been attacked once or twice, so there is uh, a continued uh, patrol there and operations there. Uh, so that, 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 that place has been quiet. Uh, Kaduna Airport, of course, and NDA are close together. Uh, so, and you all know when the bandits tried to uh, go into NDA and succeeded in even arresting, uh, you know, kidnapping an officer. But they tried recently and they were wiped out because we, you know, we knew they were coming. So they were ready for them. And they, you know, they, I, I think they, about 30 of them were killed or, or something like that, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, what we've always said is the way to end this banditry is simultaneous military and ground operations. If we have the Air Force <clears throat> bombing the, the camps, we know, the, we know where the camps are. We have the maps. We know everything. We have their phone numbers. We listen to their conversations uh, sometimes. So, but it has to be done across the five states and the and Niger state at the same time. What we've been doing over the years is you go to Zamfara, you chase them out, they move to Sokoto. You go to Sokoto, you chase them out, they move to Kebi. From Kebi, they move to Katsina, Kaduna. And they move seamlessly because of the forest ranges. So what needs to be done is at the same time bomb the, bomb the forests, bomb the camps, and have ground troops on the ground as a blocking force consisting of the army, the, 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 the police, the Air Force Special Forces, Navy Special Forces on the ground, and just wipe them out once and for all. Of course, that has risks because some of the camps may also contain innocent people that have been kidnapped. But this is war. In war, you always have collateral damage, unfortunately. And if we continue piecemeal approach to this banditry, it will continue to grow because the amount of money these guys are making is so much that they will not stop. I am convinced of that. Because the average Fulani man makes 200, 300,000 when he sells one of his bulls that, are, that, that, that is too tired. They don't usually sell their cows unless they are totally exhausted. Now, this same person now gets millions from kidnapping. He will never go back to that life. This is why I'm convinced that the only solution is to wipe them all out or at least decimate them to a point that it is no longer feasible or profitable for you to think you can be in that business. Because it is a business. That's what it is. Um, so please go back to the previous slide. So th th this, is, th this is what we are working on now. And we've got our vigilance service also armed. And when I say we, I'm not talking about Kaduna State alone. I'm not talking about Niger. I'm talking about Kebi. I'm talking about, you know, all of us. We work together. We are all on the same page that we need to do this. And we're working with the military. Uh, we regularly uh, confer with the Chief of Defense Staff, Chief of Army Staff, Chief of Air Staff, Chief of you know, IG. We're working on this. So we think that we're at a tipping point that we are going to see the end of this very soon, by the grace of God. Next slide. Um, on the advice of the military, we also, you know, uh, implemented some steps like, you know, shutting down mobile networks for a while. We don't use, we, we restrict the use of motorcycles because these bandits use motorcycles for logistics. It is motorcycles that carry food to them, drugs, and even ammunition. Um, we also suspended weekly markets to cut off food supply to them, and that has been quite effective. Um, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So all these measures we've been t taking to, you know, to, 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 to bring an end to this. But in addition to this, next slide, you see some of the soft initiatives. Because 
like in southern Kaduna, um, even when we have enough security footprint there, people must choose to live in peace. So you still have to engage in some dialogue and peace building and community, and that's why we established the Kaduna Peace Commission. Plateau also has a peace building agency, but our own peace commission has enjoyed international support, Ford Foundation, U.S. Institutes of Peace, and so on. In fact, our first executive uh, uh, vice chairman has just been offered a job by the African Union because she has been so good in, in, in handling that job that she caught the attention of the African Union. So she's moved uh, to Addis. Bishop uh, Josiah Idoferon, the Secretary General of the Anglican Communion Worldwide, based in London, is the chairman. And then we have a group of priests on both sides of the religious divide, Muslims and Christians. Uh, they have formed what they call House of Kaduna Family. And they basically engage in peace building and preaching for peaceful coexistence and so on and so forth. We've also enacted a religious preaching law to license preachers because we believe that most of the problems that are caused in Kaduna State were caused by people that did not go to seminary or did not get proper training to be imams, and they somehow declared themselves prophets or bishops or, 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 or sheikhs and get on a podium and spew out hatred and all kinds of stuff. The history of Kaduna State shows that. And that's why this law was originally enacted in 1984 by the military regime of uh, Air, Air Commodore Usman Muaz when President Buhari was head of state. That was when it was first enacted, but we, we looked at it, we, we passed it through the democratic process and uh, updated the, the law and also reduced the, um, the, the, the militariness in it, let me put it that way. Uh, and all this have helped in trying to build peace in the state. Um, we've also uh, spent a lot of money on technology. We are the first state to buy drones, UAVs, for surveillance. And that's why when I say we know where these bandits are, we do. We know where they are. We have, we've, we've invested in the technology. We are also... Uh, 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 doing what we call safe city project. We are putting TV cameras, CCTV all over Kaduna metropolis so that when crime takes place, we can get your face, we can, we can, we can get the number plate of your car, we can, you know, it's quite, the cameras are really advanced cameras, biometric quality. Uh, and they are being, uh, uh, we've finished the first phase done by an American company. The second phase is being done by Huawei. And before the end of this year, by the grace of, by, by end of May, I think, by the grace of God, Kaduna will be covered. Then we'll move to Zaria and Kafanchan. Um, we are also building a forensic laboratory because if you have a person's face as a criminal, but you don't have criminal records, you don't have fingerprints, you don't have uh, DNA capacity, you cannot, uh, you know, right now in Nigeria, we do not have a high world-class forensic lab. And that's why proving crimes is so difficult for the police. But we're, we, we, we are building a, a, a high-tech forensic laboratory that will hand over to the police to use uh, for crimes. And this lab and its capabilities will be linked to our safe city project, uh, they will be working together all in an effort to reduce incidents of crime in Kaduna State. Uh, we'll have a single security operations coordinating center. That is already done. We are actually in, we've invited President Buhari uh, to come back in May so that he will commission some of this because the forensic lab would have been done by then. Uh, the, the safe city would have, would have been done by then. So this is what we, 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 we are doing. So those that say that the federal government is doing nothing are being unfair. Those that say that the state government is doing nothing is being grossly unfair. We are collaborating. We are trying to get to the end of this problem. But these are the challenges. And we should be upfront about it and understand it. We have insufficient security footprint. Nigeria has a population of 210 million people. We need at least 2.1 million 
we, no, we need at least 1.1 million policemen. We have only one third of that. Muiwa, please come, come forward. We have only one third of that. So we don't have enough police. Okay? Our armed forces is small. The total size of the Nigerian armed forces, Navy, Air Force, Army, everyone is maybe 150,000. The DSS is even smaller. They just recruited and I think doubled to like 20 or 30,000. So we do not have enough boots on the ground to cover everywhere. There are many ungoverned spaces in Nigeria because we don't have enough people. We need more, uh, uh, more of our police particularly. We need more people in the army, in the air force and so on. So we have shortage of personnel. We have insufficient equipment. Some of these bandits have better equipment than our security forces. So we need to ramp up, you know, arming our security forces, getting them the best equipment and also technology. So this is all about uh, uh, security. Um, I will now uh, try to go to the more positive side of what we have been doing in spite of this. And I would like all of you to reflect at the end of this, if we did not have the security challenges, where we would have been? And since we came into office, there is no month that we have spent less than 200 million on supporting security agencies. No month. And that is small compared to some other states. I hear that some other states spend much more. No month. In some months, we spend up to 400 million. If there are some special operations and so on and so forth that the police or the army or the air force don't have a budget for, we have to provide it. So a lot of money leaks through security that could have been used for development. And the sense of insecurity also discourages development and, uh, and, 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 and progress. But this is what we've been trying to do in Kaduna State. And I will present our progress in several parts, about five or six parts. The first is human capital development, because the human being is the reason why we are in government, to develop the human being. Education, in Kaduna we've made education, not just basic education. You know, you, we have a national basic education policy that says primary and three years of junior secondary school should be free. In Kaduna State, primary and secondary, 12 years of education is free for everyone. You don't pay a penny. And those in boarding schools get three meals. Their parents pay nothing for that. We even give uniforms. We've stopped that because we want parents to at least do something. Okay? So education is free. We have... We have standard curriculum. We don't have any schools that are called al schools because we think that it's stigmatizing such schools. So all the schools have the same curriculum. Even the Quranic schools now must have full primary school curriculum and so on and so forth. And we, and, and, and we are doing that. We are upgrading school infrastructure. We have 4,280 primary schools in Kaduna State. 4,280. And we have moved enrollment of kids in primary school, the, the 1.1 million when we took over. Today is 2.1 million. We've nearly doubled enrollment. We've taken more than 700,000 out of school children back to school. Because it's free, you have no excuse. And we are enacting a law that will make it a crime for any parent to take his child out of school without completing 12 years of education. You must complete 12 years of education. You cannot marry until you complete 12 years of education. Okay? We have done our best to improve teacher quality. 
In our first term of office, we fired 22,000 primary school teachers. And we are told that we will not win the election, that it's dangerous to touch teachers. We said, let's lose the second term if our children would get better education. We fired 22,000 and hired 25,000. We have tested them recently. Some of them have fallen back, they have failed. We are going to get rid of them and hire more people. We are determined to continue to improve teacher quality because the teacher is education. It's not the classroom. If you have a good teacher, with or without a classroom, you can educate a child. So we are focused on that. We are now assessing the secondary school teachers because we took our eyes off that and we've just found out that there are primary school holders, certificate holders teaching in secondary schools. We all thought the thugs were going to primary schools. Now we have to get rid of some teachers in secondary schools as well. But we have hired about 7,700 secondary school teachers. They are just standing by for us to ease these ones out. And we have taken a decision as public officers to enroll our children in public schools. I took my child to a public school because we want to show that we believe in the quality of public education, which we all got and got to where we are. I had to pull my son out because some people were planning to mount a special operation to kidnap him. I don't think they will succeed, but it will put other children at risk. So I pulled him out, so he's getting homeschooling until the situation improves. We've also introduced merit-based and need-based scholarships. So you don't get a scholarship unless you are a top class student, straight A student, you get automatic scholarship. This, that's merit-based. And if the annual income of your family, of your parents, is less than, I think, 500,000 a year, you get need-based scholarship. But if your father is the governor, you don't get a scholarship, but you can get a student's loan. So we have three windows. We have merit, we have need, we have student loans. So we have two billion in first uh, city monument bank that you can borrow, finance your education, and pay after graduation. You have like 10 years to pay something. It's a partnership with first city monument bank. We put in a billion, they put in a billion so that the interest rate will be single digit. But they administer the so we make sure that there is a window for everyone. And that's why even when we increased at, uh, university, polytechnic, school fees, it was not a problem. We said, look, you can either get a scholarship or you go and take a loan. Your education will not cost you more than a million, even with the new school fees. Surely, after you get a job, you can pay back one million in 10 years. It's less than... 10,000 a month you'll be paying, okay? So we have this, and in addition, please go back because I want to speak about Kashim Ibrahim Fellowship. We have what we call Kashim Ibrahim Fellowship Program. What do we do? We advertise and pick initially 16, now 24 Nigerians, aged between 25 and 35, and they spend one year working in various parts of Kaduna State Government attending leadership seminars. We invite former heads of state, former governors and sitting governors and so on to speak to them, to teach them public leadership. We are trying to create a new generation of young Nigerians that are interested in public service, that see the importance of public service. Because we realize that in this country, our best and brightest people go to work for oil companies, telecoms companies, or banks. The others go to academia. We don't get the best and brightest in public service. Everybody wants to keep away from public service. And if we don't get our, our brightest people in public service, this country will never make progress. So we started this program. It, it is, uh, we are taking, it's in its fourth year now. We are just advertising for the fifth cohort. And each of those young people spend one year they are designated special assistants to the governor 
and they are rotated around agencies so that they learn how the state government works. And they attend leadership seminars every quarter. Uh, in this uh, month of March, we are taking them to South Africa. They visit uh, uh, an African country. They study countries that have succeeded. They study China, India, uh, Singapore. You know, what did they do? How did they succeed? Why are we where we are? And many of them, fortunately, have chosen to remain in public service. And we track them very well, and they are doing very, very well, all of them. But um, every Nigerian is eligible to apply. One third of the class must be Kaduna State, because we pay for it. He who pays the piper should dictate the tune to some extent. But in this cohort of 24, I think we have people from 16 states, 16 young people, and they stay in one place together, they spend the whole year together, they become lifetime friends, and they all go back to their various states and continue to contribute. Uh, it's a program that we are very proud of, and we think uh, that every state should do it. And indeed, uh, Governor Saonlu is starting a Latif Jakande fellowship program similar to this, because we, he, he, we invited him to speak to the fellows, and he liked what he saw. Um, then health. We've done a lot in expanding access. We are on our way to achieving universal health coverage in Kaduna because we have contributory health insurance scheme uh, so you can go to any hospital and get treated without being out of pocket once you join the scheme. We've renovated, uh, we've taken over all the primary health centers from local governments. We have rebuilt and equipped them. We have hired over 3,000 nurses and midwives, um, and we now have a primary health center within five kilometers of every citizen of Kaduna State. You can reach a, an equipped primary health center with a qualified nurse, qualified midwife that are available 24-7. Most of the primary health centers now, we are connecting with solar grids. We are providing them 24-7 electricity using solar grids. The UK government uh, did 34 for us. The EU provided 10 million euros for some, and we're doing the balance using uh, Indian line of credit, Indian Exim Bank line of credit. So all these primary health centers will have power 24-7. This helps routine immunization, this, you know, everything. So we've done a lot of that in, uh, in health as well. We are also uh, revamping our general hospitals we are building a nuclear medicine center. By the time it is done, we hope by the end of this year, we will have the best cancer center in, sub in, 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 in West Africa, at least, if not Sub-Saharan Africa. It's being financed with the assistance of Islamic Development Bank. Um, the, the NSI is also building a second cancer center in Kaduna, so we hope that a lot of uh, medical tourism will now be targeting Kaduna rather than Egypt or Dubai or India. So we've done a lot in health. In the areas of social development, we've created a Ministry of Human Services and Social Development. We've focused from day one on giving young people and women opportunities. So in our first time, out of 14 commissioners, we had six women. In our second time, I think we now have 17 commissioners. I think there are seven or eight women? Seven. Okay? We have the first elected deputy governor, female deputy governor um, in Kaduna State. The second in the entire northern history of northern Nigeria. Pauline Talion was the first in Plato. It never happened until Dr. Hadiza Balarebe was elected with me. Um, and for, for us, it was important to put forward women because we want our young girls in the north to grow up thinking that I can be Amina Mohammed, I can be Dr. Hadiza Balarabi, I can be Ngozi Okonje Iwala, not just be a housewife. It was very important for us, so it was a deliberate policy, and I deliberately picked a woman to be my running mate because I wanted to push that agenda. And the people of Kaduna State supported me by electing us overwhelmingly. Um, we are the first state to domesticate the Child Rights Act. Um, we have empowerment programs. We have training and funding for graduate entrepreneurs. We take them through months of training. 
they get a diploma in entrepreneurship, and they put up a business plan, and with their certificate as collateral, we give them a loan in collaboration with Bank of Industry. Again, we put money, Bank of Industry put the money so that the interest rate will be affordable and we lend them. And this has created about, in the, in the five, six years since we ran it, it has created 620 small businesses. These people that have gone through this program have gone to establish their businesses. Some are even at the second level of expansion. CADSWEF is a special fund for women. We lean to women entrepreneurs, those that uh, 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 fry akara, you know, those that uh, sell masa and so on and so forth. Small uh, microcredit that can transform them. We also have a program that is not mentioned here, CADAT, which we train artisans because we realize that our electricians, our plumbers, those that do POP are all from Benin Republic. So we started training people in Kaduna to do this so, and, and it has been very, very successful and we get the construction companies that work for us to absorb them. Um, so we have these social development programs as well. We also have uh, been a job creating government. We've sacked many people that were unqualified or uh, could not upgrade their skills, but we've hired even more people than we have sacked. We've, we've, we've hired 40,000 new civil servants in the last uh, five, six years. Those that can use computers, those that uh, have degrees, they are young, they are smart, and they are driven. In the last 12 months alone, we've, uh, you know, hired this. Most of them are teachers, by the way, and nurses and midwives. Um, so, um, in idea, apart from that, training, very important thing that is often ignored. We dedicate 2% of our federation account uh, allocation for training civil servants. Because what we found was that many civil servants have not gone for training for five years, 10 years. And when they go for training, they just go uh, to some place in Dubai and just have a holiday. It's not real training. We no longer use ASCON. We don't use Center for Management Development. We have our universities. So we have a 2% two, two of uh, FAC set aside under the office of the head of service to send people for training. And you know why we send them? We send them to the best universities in the world. They go to Harvard, Oxford. Those are the places we send them to and the best universities in Nigeria to be trained in leadership. You know, we, we, we took a legal drafting department to England to do a course on legal drafting. So we do a lot of training. We find that this is one of the basic problems in the public service, inadequate training. Next slide. <clears throat> then, of course, wages and pensions. There are governors that start complaining and start abusing Mr. President the moment salaries are due. <laughs> we are not one of those governors. Um, we are the first government to pay the minimum wage after the minimum wage act was enacted. We did it before the federal government, actually. Federal government paid arrears, but we didn't have to pay arrears because we started. We also raised the minimum pension in Kaduna to the minimum wage, 30,000, because we found that some people, all permanent secretaries that retired, are getting a 5,000 naira pension. Because at that time, that was a lot of money. So we raised the, 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 the minimum pension to 30,000, and we inherited 14 billion gratuity and death benefit arrears from the previous government. We've paid all that. They stopped paying from 2010. That's PDP for you. 2010, when oil prices were at $100 a barrel, they stopped paying death benefits and gratuity, left behind 14 billion for us. So far, we've paid 14.83. We've cleared the arrears. We introduced a contributory pension scheme from January 2017. And we are one of the three states in Nigeria that PENCOM ranks as being fully compliant with the Contributory Pension Act. Um, and since 2017, we've paid over 13.9 billion in accrued rights. What are accrued rights? Um, you start working for the government, you spent 10 years 
and then contributory pension starts. You start contributing from your 11th year. But what about the 10 years that you served? There is supposed to be a contribution by you and the government for that 10 years. That is what is accrued right. But it has gone. You cannot contribute, so the government has to take that burden. So every month, we pay $1.52 billion as our contribution, and then we pay another uh, $1.2 billion as retirement bond redemption to cover, for, to cover the accrued rights. We've been doing that consistently since we came into office without fail, and we don't uh, blame President Buhari when we cannot do so. We've never failed to do so. We also decided to sell all government houses because they are all run down, they are not being maintained because if you don't own something, you don't invest money in it. Civil servants will be waiting for money to change a bulb in their bedroom because it's not their house. So we sold the houses to them. 83% of the houses were bought by civil servants and we created a mortgage system in partnership with Stalin Bank and two other banks so that they can borrow at 9% interest and pay over I, I don't remember, 10 years or 15 years. So 83% of the houses were bought by civil servants. The balance were bought by people outside because we allow people to bid. And you match the bid if you're in occupation. Next slide. We've also learned from the federal government this cash transfer, we've seen how it has changed the lives of people in Kaduna. And we want to have our own social protection program, state-level social protection program. And we've, we've developed a, a policy, we've studied some countries, you know, Seychelles, Mauritius, that have this minimum uh, 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 wage and all that. And we are, we've expanded our social register. We now know we have 2.3 million vulnerable people in Kaduna that are poor. We have them, we have their biometrics, and any time we want to assist them, we know how to target and assist them. Um, we, are, we, we, are, we still continue to work on the social register, and we hope that uh, you know, we'll soon start conditional cash transfers. Now I'll move to infrastructure. Um, a lot of what I have talked about in human capital is not something that people see. The reason why governments don't invest in education is because the results of investment come in 30 years. So you can come and spend your eight years as governor, do nothing about education, nobody will realize it, but 30 years later, you'll get Boko Haram. This is part of the problem we're dealing with. It is under investment in education and social development that is giving us all these security challenges today. But we are committed to investing in education even though the results will not be apparent now. And I have outlined some of what we've done now. Infrastructure is what people see, it's what people praise you for. And it's important, but it's not as important as education and healthcare. Um, these are some of the things that we have done. Urban renewal, which was what President Buhari was praising. Um, the urban renewal are not just roads, but we have markets, shopping malls, you know, we have social housing. We are building houses that we give, we sell to the uh, low income. Um, we are building parks and recreational areas. We are working with the French Development Agency to do a BRT in Kaduna. Uh, we are discussing with the Indian, Russian Rail, and some Chinese firms to do uh, a, a light rail in Kaduna. And then in each of the local government headquarters, we are doing 10 kilometers of township roads. Um, we, are, we, are, we, we are looking at doing a new Western Bypass that will be a told PPP project. Um, and of course, when you go to Kaduna, you see all this. Uh, we, we, Zaria City, for those that went to Amadibele University, know how Zaria City used to be, and Zaria area has not had water running from taps for 40 years. But we debottlenecked it, and we've completed phases one and two. There is water in Zaria now. And we are working with the federal government to address the same water shortage now we have in Kaduna Metropolis. Because there are water shortages. The metropolis has expanded beyond the capacity of the treatment plant there. And um, 
we are working with the Federal Ministry of Water Resources and the Africa Development Bank to, to, to do that. Uh, of course, we are doing a lot of investment in renewables, and we are building our own 84 megawatt power plant. Uh, we drew uh, 7.5 billion loan from the Central Bank uh, Power Intervention Fund, and we are working on that side by side with the 250 megawatts that the federal government is building in Kudenda. In the areas of economic development and investments, when we came into office 2015, Kaduna State was ranked number 24 by the World Bank in the ease of doing business ranking for states. We are number 24 out of 37. By 2018, we had moved to number one because we are determined to make Kaduna the most attractive place for businesses. And what did we do? We, we implemented significant reforms in governance, in, in investment promotion that I will speak about later. Uh, we computerize our land register. Uh, you get your land title in no time. You get you know, mortgages and everything in no time. Uh, we've also created two special economic zones uh, that already have presence of industries. You will see some of them. Um, of course, uh, Kaduna Geographic Information Service, our digital land registry, is one of the most advanced in Africa, not just in Nigeria. Um, I did uh, ages in Abuja some years back. Uh, what we've done in Kaduna is even far ahead of ages because, of course, there are more technologies now and more things. Um, and in the last five years, we have issued 51,000 certificates of occupancy. 51,000. We have recertified titles and, you know, we, 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 we... Because of some of these reforms, we've moved our internal generator revenue from 13 billion in 2015 to 52.7 billion in 2021. And we hope to keep moving. These are some of the uh, investments that have come to Kaduna. This is the most important, which we hope Mr. President will commission in May. Um, this is a 600 million iron ore mining, processing, and steel production plant on the road to Kaduna near Jerry. If you're driving, you'll see, you'll not miss it. It's a huge complex. This is what we've been trying to do in Ajakuta for 60 years. We've achieved it in Kaduna in three years without a penny of government money. We just gave the land. There is iron ore in the land. They got the license from the federal government. There is iron ore. They came. We organized the land. We gave them C of O. We revoked all the titles. We compensated. We resettled people. And they are investing $600 million. And by May this year, Mr. President will commission it. And Nigeria will produce its first steel. Not from Ajakuta, but from a private company. African Natural Resources and Mines. They got the license when Kai Defiming was Minister of Mines. And now we have, we've achieved what Ajakuta has been unable to achieve after 60 years, and last time I checked, about $8 billion spent. And many people don't know, but we still spend about 5 billion naira every year on Ajakuta producing nothing. But that's another story. This is tomato joss, but they are in Kaduna, they are not in joss, <laughs> okay? Um, incorporated as tomato joss, her plan was to set it up in joss, but Kaduna's environment was better so we said, keep the name so that Joss will keep remembering how they lost. This factory produces 10% of Nigeria's tomato paste. And they produce the tomato there and they process it. And she works with a, with a network of farmers, giving them extension services, seedlings, and so on. And the farmers moved their tomato production, they multiplied their productivity five times. And you can see all of them. You can see the difference. They are wearing brocade. They are looking rich. Um, 
we commissioned the plant in September 2021 and it's producing. Next slide. This is Mahindra, the uh, manufacturing tractors in Kaduna, Mahindra of India. Next. And this is the largest vehicle assembly plant in Nigeria now. This is a joint venture between Angote Industries and Pujo of France. The old pan has been sold to an Indian group. Pujo has pulled out of that, so they did a joint venture with Angote. Kaduna State and KB State are shareholders, but very small shareholders. But the plant is ready, and they have already started production this month in February, and we hope Mr. President will commission it in May. It will assemble not just saloon vehicles, but trucks, trailers, SUVs, you know, everything. Then governance. Governance reforms are very important, but they are not seen. But they are what will put the state on a permanent path of growth and development. So in governance, we have done many firsts. We are the first to implement Treasury single account. We are the first state to introduce electronic voting in our local government elections because we don't want to win everything. We want free and fair elections. And we want the electorate to vote on our performance and performance of our local government chairman. And we have not done badly. Um, we have also adopted citizenship by residence. We don't allow anyone to be called indigent, anyone to be called settler. And we've created metropolitan authorities, mayoralties, in our three major cities, in Kafanchan, in Kaduna, and Zaria, we have administrators of those metropolitan authorities that cover more than one local government. Because we believe, like Abuja, and this is from my experience in Abuja, cities must be managed as organic, single organic beings. Somebody must be in charge of a city, not three or four local governments. Then no one is in charge. And this is why we created these metropolitan authorities, uh, cabinet level administrators. And we are the first state, and indeed, up till today, the only state to be admitted into the Open Government Partnership. Usually, only countries are admitted, but apart from Nigeria being admitted, Kaduna has been admitted as a member of OGP, and in fact, uh, we sit on one of their boards because of what we have shown in reform. We have also done major reform of the public service. We reduced the number of ministries. We, we, we changed our budget paradigm. We've consistently allocated at least 60% to capital expenditure. Last year, we did 70% capital, 30% recurrent. And education, health alone, consistently accounted for at least 40% of our budget. Education, at least 25%, health, at least 15% every single year since we started. Um, we also noticed there is a lot of silo mentality in government, you know, ministries not talking to each other. So we created what we call policy councils that meet every morning between 8 and 10. Five policy councils, Economic Development Council, um, Human Capital Development Council, uh, Procurement Council, which are the other two? Infrastructure, Infrastructure Development Council and Institutional Development Council. Institutional Development Council looks after reforms. Economic Development Council brings all the economic ministries and agencies together. They meet every week. So that they keep moving in the same direction. And the walls of hiding information just collapse. And it has made our government far more effective. We, we recommend it to every uh, government. And um, this is our own innovation. We, we didn't learn it anywhere else. We have some really smart young people that come up with these ideas. Um, we've also established many reform agencies. You know, our tax uh, our body, our pension bureau. We have residency registration because for you to qualify for free education, free healthcare, and so on, you have to show that you're a Kaduna resident. Otherwise, all the people in Kano will move to Kaduna. You know how Kano people, <laughs> they like free things. <laughs> Okay, so 
So we've created a, res uh, a Kaduna Resident Identity Management Agency that, that registers residents, not indigents, residents. And that, uh, that uh, agency has so far registered, I don't know, how many? Four million people? 4.2 million people. In fact, more people have registered under the NIN in Kaduna State than any other state because of our Kadrima is linked to NIMSI. So once you are registered as a resident, you also automatically get an NIN. So you get two cards. You get the NIMSI card and you get our own residence card. And you take your child to school, you have to show that. Um, and one of the things that we've done in Kaduna, I think that is unique perhaps in Nigeria, is the diversity of our leadership, political leadership in the state. We have representation in our cabinet from, I don't know, last time we checked, about 14 or 15 states of Nigeria. We have Anambra, Delta, you know, Oyo, Muiwa here is Kwara, though he was born in Sabon Garinzaria. And we have, you know, we, we take people from anywhere that can make Kaduna better. Because the people of Kaduna are only concerned with results. They are not concerned with where you, whether you come from the moon. If a child gets education, you don't want to know who taught him. You just want the child to be educated. When you are getting on a plane, you don't ask for the religion or ethnicity of the pilot. Or you go to a hospital, you don't ask for the religion or ethnicity or whether the doctor is an indigent. So in Kaduna, we just don't talk about it. We practice it from our political appointees to our teachers to our doctors to our nurses. Everywhere we look for those that are willing and able to work for the state and deliver results. I was roundly criticized for the policy in our first time, and we were promised electoral defeat, but we won again. Um, and we think that's where Nigeria should go. Everywhere should be like that. As far as I know, apart from Kaduna, only Lagos practices it to some extent. Only Lagos. Um, we brought back development planning. We do five-year plans. Our first plan was 2015, 2016 to 2020. We are implementing 2021 to 2025 now, and we hope the next administration will do 2026 to 2030. Um, and we also have sector implementation plans that are drawn from the state development plan. Uh, the next is the residency card program. This is a basic foundation of governance. You cannot govern people you don't know. You need statistics. You need their biometrics. You need to know where they live. You need to know where they pay taxes. You need to know what they do for a living to be able to plan. That's why we started the residency program. It's not just to keep Kano people out. They are welcome to come in if they stay in Kaduna and pay taxes in Kaduna. We don't mind. We welcome every Nigerian. We have enrolled so far, as I said, 4.2 million people. We've attracted nearly $3 billion in investments. Uh, industries keep coming to Kaduna on a daily basis because our investment promotion agency is one of the most friendly, one of the most efficient. And our government, our bureaucrats, consider people that come to invest in Kaduna as customers. They treat them as customers. They don't try to hide files or be difficult. They try to be helpful. And this is what we have done so far. They want to show you um, some videos on tomato juice and olam and, uh, and dangote pujo. Thank you very much.
Rotten Tomato Jaws in 2014. Director of Tomato Jaws. When I first started Tomato Jaws in 2014, we were farming on just half a hectare in Nasarawa State. I came to Kaduna in 2017 with the rest of the team. We closed down the Nasarawa operation. Uh -huh. We opened up a farm here. The Kaduna please, State please, government please. is very generous. Uh, please, well, it's not, of we're not finished yet. And today we're very proud to say that we're farming on over 100 hectares of that farmland. So we're rapidly increasing our utilization of the land. Um, of course, it takes time. With the rainy season, you can farm maize everywhere, but on the dry season with tomatoes, we have to invest in irrigation. So as we continue to invest in irrigation, we will continue to use more and more of that 500 hectares. In 2014, we just had about five staff. By the time we came to get ready for the factory, we had about 40 full-time staff on ground. Um, and today we have over 140. We have 142 staff today. We're very, very excited about that. In addition to the full-time staff, we also do have day laborers, so people who come in and support the farming activities and the processing activities. Earlier on in about 2018, 2019, we would have as many as 50 day laborers in a day. Now that's increased to over 500. If you come and we're doing harvesting and processing activities, you will, might even see up to 1,000 people in the day harvesting, gainfully employed, making good money, and taking that back to their families. Furthermore, we also, as I said, work with farmers. From three years ago, we were working with around 200 farmers, but today we're working with over 2,400 farmers. Kadipa has been amazingly helpful to Tomato Joss ever since 2015 when we first started looking for a permanent home. I looked for land in over 10 different states in northern Nigeria, we were constrained to the north because of the weather requirements for tomato. We needed to have somewhere that tomatoes naturally grow. And the Kaduna State Government, right from the get-go, was really, really interested in bringing Tomato Joss in as an investor. They took the time. They were very serious. They showed us, even within the state, over 50 different areas of land for us to potentially settle before we found the right place for us in Kangimi here. They also continue to provide amazing support up to today. They've provided us with support on security. They've provided us with support on community relations and helping us to integrate fully into the local community, which we're very, very happy to have done. We have a lot of great support from the Hakimi. We have a lot of great support from our Sarki. And we know that that is in part because of the strengthening of the relationship that Kadipa has helped us to do. In addition to that, Thank you, yes. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, with the very inspiring narratives. Yeah, as I was saying, uh, with such a very inspiring narrative from His Excellency, I believe that we have um, enough reasons to believe that better things are looking in our direction. Uh, before I take questions, before we take questions from the floor, let me just um, mention a little bit about the comments we had online. Uh, one, my head, communication says constant communication is key. One guy, Consuel the Aviator, says you're the best performing governor. Long live Governor El Rufai. One, Nuhu Ibrahim says forensic experts also needed in our security architecture. One, uh, Cynthia says a true leader, indeed, the kind of leadership we will need. Let me, there are some others. I think the, he actually deserves a round of applause. We don't actually clap for people, but from what we've heard today,
He really deserves it. Um, questions? In this order, Choji of Vaughan, Dr. Anuli of AP, Mr. Obali Doshwela, and Daily Trust. So I will take the first course, first four, or that's will four. Morning, Your Excellency. My name is Timothy Choji. I report for Voice of Nigeria. As said by the moderator, you've spoken so well. You've enlightened us on so many good things that you've done for Kaduna State. I want to know if you have a specific plan in place to ensure that soon after your second term of office, you have somebody or someone who would ensure continuity so that these good things you've done will not just pass away with you as you end your regime. Uh, we also know that the security situation in some parts of the state seem to have deferred solutions. Uh, what are you doing apart from the kinetic measures being taken? What practical steps are you taking to ensure that these things come to an end? Thank you. Your Excellency, my name is uh, Dr. Anule Emanuel. I write for AFP News Agency. Your Excellency, you outlined uh, efforts of your government in collaboration with uh, federal security forces to tackle issues of uh, banditry and kidnapping in your state and in collaboration with uh, the Northwest states. Uh, do you see the situation in uh, the Northwest now as more violent than the insurgency in the Northeast? And if, it's, if that is correct, uh, why do you think this is so? Your Excellency, my name is Uba Lemuza, and I report for Deutsche Valley. My concern is the economy of the banditry. You might mention that you, are, you know them, you know the bandits, you know where they are, you intercept their communication, if I'm right. Then the major issue behind banditry, to my belief, is the issue of the economy. The millions of naira being collected as ransom, taken to bushes and the forest, are you tracking them? One. And uh, if you are tracking them, like we had in the Boko Haram issue, have you arrested those who are behind, those who are operating at the strategic level of banditry? Not the flying in the bush, but the custodians of the millions of Naira who I believe are mostly in the cities. Are you tracking them? If you are tracking them, have you made arrests? Thank you. Yeah. Your Excellency, I'm um, I write for Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, my question, we just followed the line of the, the last question. Uh, and it has to do with, you said we have invested in uh, technology and we know where these people are. And you also said you listen to the conversation of some of these people. Uh, you have only been somebody who is very frank while expressing his views, and I need a very frank response. Uh, why is it difficult to have a unanimity of purpose? I'm talking about, you said you are ready to eliminate these people. Why is it that the stakeholders have not come together to actually pursue this stand you are making that you should eliminate these people since you know where they are? to avoid the conspiracy theories. For your patience, uh, I took much more than 20 minutes, but I hope you understand. I, it's difficult to summarize uh, seven years in 20 minutes. Um, the first question from uh, my brother from Voice of Nigeria is on su succession and continuity. How, well, 
No, I wish there was an answer to that question. I wish there is a silver bullet. Um, my hope is that the voters in Kaduna will first appreciate the difference between our eight years and the previous 16 years and vote for APC again. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is my hope is that one of the members of our team, one of the members of our current team, you know, someone that has been part of this last seven years and knows the method behind the madness, okay? Because everything that we've done, we thought through, we debated before implementing them. Um, and if an outsider comes, it is very easy to deceive and persuade that outsider to take a different course. I've seen that happen in FCT, you know, where some of the things that we put in place were reversed by my immediate predecessor. Because he's a complete outsider, he didn't know what was done. If someone within the FCT system that had worked with us the previous years had succeeded me as minister, for instance, there would have been some degree of continuity because there would be no debate about psyching teachers that are not qualified, for instance, okay? If the people of Kaduna State vote back that other party, those thugs that we sacked will come back as teachers. There is nothing I can do about that. But my hope is that, as we saw in 2019, the people of Kaduna are smart enough, they have seen the difference between the two parties and the two governance styles, and they will make the right decision. On our own part as a party, my hope is that uh, our members will vote for someone from within our team to continue to build where we've left off, correct some of our errors, and uh, uh, go forward. That's my hope. But it is something that keeps me awake at night. I'm more worried about the succession in Kaduna than I am about the uh, next president of Nigeria. Um, but other than pray a lot and uh, seek for God to choose for the people of Kaduna what is best for them, not necessarily what I want, okay? I have some preferences for who will succeed me. Of course, I've worked with people for eight, seven, eight years. Some of them I've worked with for 20 years. I know them very well. I can guarantee that they will do this, they will do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to the people of Kaduna State. If they buy my arguments and uh, go, and uh, I'm unlikely to uh, come out and anoint one person, I will put uh, my team in a room and try to get them to agree to a, to a successor. If they're able to agree, then it's easy. We all go out, you know, this is our man, this is the person that was part of everything and is likely to continue to build on where we are. So support him. It will be easier to talk to the party uh, leadership and membership to say this is the one that we've all agreed. All the potential uh, aspirants or all the aspirants. But you know how politics is. Everybody uh, thinks he can win. So it is not likely that you can convince people to agree uh, to this. And I, I, I will not force anybody, uh, anyone. Uh, so we will see how the selection process goes. But you are right, it's a, it's, it's a major issue, uh, but what can you do about it? Uh, you just do your best and leave the rest to God. Uh, on security, you know, one of the slides shows some of the non-kinetic measures we've taken. We've established the Kaduna Peace Commission, we have the House of Kaduna Family, we have regular security council meetings, we have uh, uh, we are forming a farmers, harders, uh, uh, reconciliation committees at all local governments so that when there is any issue between farmers and harders, they go in and be the first line of uh, re uh, re uh, resolution and so on. Uh, but um, some of the issues that have, some of the insecurity, the challenges that have endured have more to do with ethnic and religious intolerance this banditry is a new phenomenon. Uh, 
uh, the one that Kaduna has been famous for is ethno-religious crisis. We have managed to contain that to a large extent, and uh, I think people are learning to live together. People, the ethnic enclaves, particularly in Kaduna, are dissolving. People now, you know, Muslims and Christians live together now because everyone feels safe enough. Uh, it will take a long time, but uh, I think we are moving in the right direction. I think the key issue is for people to understand that every Nigerian has the right to live anywhere in Nigeria that he or she chooses. You don't have to agree with him, but so long as he is law-abiding, you should let him be. And there is beauty in diversity. The most advanced countries in the world are those that are the most diverse. There is beauty in that. There is beauty in size. Nigeria is better, bigger, together. Um, so it's something that we have to keep working on. We've done our bit. We hope those that come after us will do theirs. Uh, Dr. Anule, I am persuaded that the insurgency in the Northwest is far more lethal, far more serious than Boko Haram, both in terms of the numbers of people affected. As you can see, these are just Kaduna numbers for one or two years. I can assure you the numbers in Zamfara and Katsina are two to three times this if they are keeping tabs. The numbers in Sokoto and Niger and Kebi will be about this. So we are talking of tens of thousands of people getting killed, getting kidnapped. It's far more serious than Boko Haram. The only thing is that these guys don't take territory. They are in the forest, in ungoverned spaces. So they do not attract the same kind of single-minded attention that Boko Haram does. And because Boko Haram's uh, ideology is religious or pretentiously religious, you know, it elicits more passion. But really, this is a far more serious problem. Because this is uh, largely a situation in which people of about the same ethnicity, about the same religion, you know, killing each other, stealing each other's property or creating an industry out of criminality is very, very, very serious. And it requires single-minded attention. And I have told you, and I, I will come to that, you know, as I said, which, 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 which brings me to the next question. Yes, we know where these bandits are. We have the maps. We have the camps. But somebody has to go in and kill them. I can't do that. Okay? Now, if that somebody doesn't have enough men, doesn't have enough firepower, doesn't have uh, technology, no one is going to commit suicide. This is why, uh, under this administration, the Nigerian Governors Forum, you know, collaborated with the federal government to take money from the excess crude account to buy these super tucanos and other armaments to help uh, strengthen our defense infrastructure. We have to continue to do that. That is one. Second, how many men do we have and women in the armed forces and the police? How many? And look at how stretched they are. The last time I checked, the Nigerian army is engaged in internal security operations in 32 states. So how many people can you spare at a time to go into these forests? These are the issues. Of course, you cannot double the size of the armed forces and police overnight. It requires selection, training, and so on. But you can invest in superior armaments and technology which can de uh, bridge that deficit. And that requires a lot of money. There was also another constraint, which I, re uh, I referred to. The fact that these guys are just disorganized groups. So you cannot call them insurgents until the Federal High Court on the application of the Attorney General, look at all the facts and said, these guys are terrorists. 
until that declaration was made, any military action against them could be considered uh, a crime against humanity. And while we are waiting for that, these guys have strengthened, they have collected a lot of money, they have done this, they have done that. So we are facing a massive monster that is, that is financially oiled, and the, the arms are there from the collapse of Libya and so on. The arms are there, they are coming in. Some of them superior to what our police and armed forces have. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done. The intelligence is the first step. We have that. But now we must have the capability to be able to um, go in and wipe out these guys. And we should not do so if it will mean putting our soldiers and our policemen at risk. One of the new phenomena that we've observed in the last month or two is planting of mines. This one is Boko Haram, it's not bandits. We lost five soldiers in an APC that, you know, got on a mine. Last week, a cow stepped on a mine and died. Luckily, no one was killed. So, it's a complex problem and it requires, you know, a, a coordinated solution. But there is, the, the solution is on the table and our hope is that, you know, this will be implemented very, very quickly. Um, a lot of work was done to track um, the financing of Boko Haram and their supply chain. Part of the reason why they have been surrendering in droves was because the financing has been cut off and their logistics chain was disrupted thanks to the government of the United Arab Emirates that caught some people, you know, sending money from there to here that went to Boko Haram. And then our own um, intelligence agencies here did a very good work. I was shocked to learn that one of the leading uh, financiers of Boko Haram lived in Zaria, Kaduna State. I was shocked. And when I saw the amount of money that went through his account, I said, how come I didn't know this? I would have taxed the man, at least. Please collect tax on it, you know. So it was an excellent job done by the, uh, the, by, by the Nigerian security agencies. It was mostly military intelligence that did it. And I think a similar exercise needs to be launched for the bandits. Because the report of the Boko Haram one also showed some links to some of the bandit leaders and, 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 and even some uh, military and police officers, okay? So this, that needs to be done. And we have already made the case to the federal government to ensure that that is done. Because if we can cut off the financing and the supply chain, you are right, nobody will take 200 million and keep in the, in the forest. It's somewhere in the towns. And we have to find that, and we have to do something about it. Once you can cut off the financing and seize the monies that they have uh, accumulated and, 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 and disrupt their logistics uh, supply chain, 50% uh, of the job is done. That's why Boko Haram people who are surrendering. It's not that they are repentant. They are starving, no food, no money, no, 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 no you know. They are not repentant. Um, so I, I think I've answered Delhi Trust's question. We know where they are, you know, but these are the constraints. These are the constraints, and um, these constraints are being addressed. More? No, three questions, and we end it. Okay, we end it. Gloria, um, Julie, Tony, and Ruth.
Yeah, you have suggested simultaneous attacks on the bandits, and uh, this is aside the issues of armaments and uh, manpower. Are you also concerned about infiltrators and moles within the security agencies that might be disempowering your efforts? If you were the president of Nigeria, I needed you to confirm this actually if you have intentions, would you even suggest this approach? Thank you. Good morning, sir. Um, my name is Juliana Taiwo Baloyin of the Sun Newspapers. Um, will your preferences among your team members for 2023 be a woman, specifically your deputy governor? <laughs> and your four days a week um, work, what are the benefits and the challenges? Uh, sir, my name is Ruth Olurumbi. I arrived for Bloomberg. You said earlier that Nigeria will produce Bloomberg. Ruth Olurumbi. Bloomberg. Yes, sir. Okay. You said earlier that Nigeria will produce its first steel by uh, this year. So I wanted to know by a private com uh, company. So I wanted if you could give us details on that. How many tons are you look uh, would be produced? Who is the who are the companies involved? Any details that you can provide, please. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Your Excellency, my name is Tony Ailemen. I write for Business Day. My question has to do with um, your political ambition after working as governor at Kaduna State. There is this rumor that you have been uh, likely to work with somebody from Southwest as vice president. Can you please confirm that? <laughs> Mm, I will answer that. Mm, we can take. We can take two more. Can take two more. Mm. Okay. Two more. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yes. Good. No, that's. Your Excellency, my name is Dr. Leon Usibe of the Nigerian Tribune. Uh, so I want your view on the reluctance of government to name and shame um, Boko Haram financiers. A uh, long time ago, we were told that um, the government is prepared to expose them, but we are still waiting. And could you please also give us a sense of uh, the financial investment your state has made in terms of um, insecurity? Because you said you are paying about 200 million naira a month or even more. Uh, how much were you refunded by the federal government? Thank you, sir. Yes, Excellency, my name is DJ Lumoyi. I write for this day newspapers. Two days ago, in this same hall, you spoke about uh, the APC politics. And uh, specifically, you mentioned the disagreement between the governors of APC uh, prior to that day. And uh, shortly after you left here, we had information about the zoning arrangement of the APC. And with the look of things, uh, the president will likely come from the South in 2023. 
as governor of uh, Kaduna State and a critical stakeholder in APC, are you likely to support a Southwest candidate for presidency? That is one. Two. Two. In the last several years or thereabout, we've seen all the beautiful work you've been able to do in Kaduna State. And I know the IGR and uh, the federal allocation will not be enough to execute this project. I'm also aware in the past you've had calls to approach the National Assembly for loans. As we speak, will you want to tell us what the debt profile of Cardinal State looks like? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, channels, am I concerned that there are infiltrators? Yes, we are concerned. We, and it is not impossible to have infiltrators. As I alluded to when I was answering this question, the preliminary report of the Boko Haram financing uh, also showed some links to bandits and uh, pointed to some police and military officers in service um, as having some communication or connection with the bandits. Okay? Um, so there is always that risk. In any system, you have traitors. Uh, and we are concerned about that. But Till date, we don't have any firm evidence of that. Um, I think a lot more work needs to be done. As I said, we need to pursue the financing and logistics chain of the banditry as well. Because the amount of money these bandits are making is enough to destabilize this country. It's a lot of money. A lot. We only have an idea of what it is because those that make the payments don't tell us the truth all the time. But we hear for, from the uh, um, legal intercepts of the conversations you know, about how much money they are asking for, how much they have received, and so on. And the, 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 the numbers are mind-boggling. It's a major source of national insecurity. And it will grow unless it is decisively dealt with. So, yeah, I, I am concerned. Now, you said if uh, I'm president, what would I do? Um, I've already, you know, you, you see, I, I, first, I'm not president. I have not thought about being president. And I have privileged access to this president. So if there is anything that I think a president should do, I would have told Mr. President. So I will not tell you what I told him needs to be done. Because my discussion with the, pre the president is privileged unless he says that he wants to disclose it. But we have discussed what needs to be done and I am assured that it's going to be done. That's all I can say. Um, and then you talked about, uh, you want to know about my ambition. I have zero ambition. None. I just want to finish this job and uh, get on with my private life. Write another book. <laughs> Make tons of money. The largest amount of money I ever got in my life was from writing Accidental Public Servant. I is still selling. Why would I tell you? <laughs> okay? So, um, I will take this question along with uh, this day's question and business day. 
Um, I, I have no ambition. I've never had any ambition. And uh, if I die today, I am quite accomplished and happy because I never in my life, based on my humble backgrounds, ever thought I would even enter uh, uh, this building, ever in my life. How? How would I ever enter where the president's office is? So for me, even being here is a privilege, if you know my background. And God has been very kind to me. Um, and my outings in public service have all been satisfactory. And uh, why push my luck and go for a job with a 90% chance of failure? Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an ambitious person. I'm just a person that gets things done when given the opportunity. That's it. And that's, that's, that, that's why, you know, I've never, I've never lobbied for a job. I've never uh, desired to, even this governorship, it was President Buhari that literally forced me to run. I wasn't interested in running. I just wanted us to defeat Jonathan and I would come to the villa and be, and be, and be enjoying myself. <laughs> uh, I would have been one special advisor, domestic, and <laughs> anytime they are flying to New York, I did there. Anytime they are, yeah, that's, that's the life. Not, not, and I would not have had gray hairs. But you know, the president insisted that some of us must go and run for governorship just in case he did not get elected again. He felt that, you know, we needed some strong governors. Those were the words he used. So I was forced into this. I have never desired to be minister of FCT. Obasanjo just called me and said, I'm appointing you. I've never wanted to be DGBP. I was called and given. That, that, that's, that's, that's it. So I, 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 I have zero ambition. I have no aspirations. Okay. Um, I want to clarify that the APC zoning arrangement that we announced is the zoning arrangement for the party. Okay, and we always did that in the last three elections we've had. When um, we elected uh, Chief John Oyegun as chairman, we had this zoning arrangement. Each zone will have these positions and so on, six zones. And we carried that to the time when Adam Soshomole assumed office as chairman. All we did now is to flip it. Okay? Since the chairman is, from north, is going to be from North Central, it means that North Central will take all the positions of South South. If you check, you will see all the positions allocated to North Central were positions held by South South under Oyegun and under Oshomole. Now, all the positions held by Northwest went to Southeast and vice versa. All the positions held by Northeast went to Southwest and vice versa. That's why Southwest will now produce the National Secretary. The National Secretary in 20, under Oyegun and uh, Oshomole was uh, Maima Labuni. So that's all we did. We are not talking about the presidency yet. We are not talking about the presidency. When we do this convention, we elect national officers, then we start preparing for the primaries that will produce our candidates for House of Assembly, House of Reps, Senate, and the presidency. That's when that conversation will take place. What we have done with the zoning presented to Mr. President on Tuesday, which he has approved, is sending a signal about the direction of the party. It is not zoning any presidency to anyone yet. But we've sent the signal. Okay, um, and you ask me if I would support a Southwest candidate. 
I will support any APC candidate if I'm satisfied he will do the best for Nigeria. I will. It doesn't matter where he's from, southwest, southeast, south, south. APC is what matters. And the quality of the person. And the discussion we are having is that the presidency is zoned to the south. It's not zoned to any particular place in the south. It's the south will have the first go at it. But we are waiting to see who are the aspirants. You know, a few people have declared their interest. We are waiting. Um, as for me personally, uh, all I can tell you is uh, unless in an exceptional situation, what President Buhari tells me, this is the one I want to be my successor. That's why I'm going, because I trust his judgment. Now, if I disagree, I will go into a room and tell him. I will tell him. We have done that a few times, and he knows. I will tell him, I say, I don't think, uh, sir, this is right, and these are my reasons. But if he still says, yes, I've heard you, Nasir, that's what I want. I say, okay, I will do it. Um, so I hope I have answered everything about 2023. And I'm surprised that a business newspaper is interested in political <laughs> Okay, let me come back to four-day work week. As you know, Kaduna State, as part of our governance reforms, introduced a four-day work week. We work from Mondays till Thursdays. Our weekends start from today. So tomorrow, nobody goes to work in the Kaduna State Public Service, unless you want to. Personally, I use Friday as my catch-up day. I go to the office. But I don't take visitors, I don't take, you know, I just use it to catch up on paperwork and long, read long memos and so on. And we usually have our executive council meetings on Mondays. The memos go out on Thursday, so, you know, you have time to now read them. So, you know, I just, you know. Um, what are the benefits? The benefits are that people rest more, they have more family time, they have more leisure time, they spend more money, it's better for the economy. <laughs> and for those that are interested in doing a side business like farming, you have more time. Um, the challenges that we face, which we have resolved as far as public service is concerned, is what is the impact on education? But we found that that was the easiest. Because schools have classes up to 12 anyway on Fridays. It's four hours. So we just increased Monday to Thursday by one hour each. So we covered that. The health sector was the easiest because the health sector always operated a shift system. 36 hours a week. Okay. Where we are having challenges is with the private sector because of overtime. Because now, if you work on Fridays, it's extra pay because it's overtime. So we have not imposed it on the private sector yet. We are discussing with them to have a transition period of two to three years. But certainly in the public sector, we've resolved all the issues. We are drafting the regulations to gazette them and Everyone in Kaduna is happy with it. There are some people that try to give it a religious angle to say, oh, you know, Erufa is doing this because he wants Muslims to have Friday off. Um, but the truth of the matter is, Friday has always been half day anyway. Most people don't work more than one or two hours on Friday. So in terms of time, we are not losing anything. In terms of religion, if you say it's religion, so why have Muslims never complained that Sunday is day off? And uh, when one uh, pastor, in, you know, we, we, we have our interactive sessions from time to time, religious harmony and so on, one pastor raised that 
I told her, I said, look, you know, you don't have to. You can, you can go to work on Friday. There is no law stopping you. But we will, we will stay at home. Enjoy. You know? So, these are the benefits and the challenges are all around the private sector. The extra cost for the private sector arising from increased overtime uh, costs. But uh, this has been implemented in many countries, in many private companies, and they have published the benefits. When people rest more, they are more productive when they come on Monday. They do much more work. And most people are tired by Thursday anyway. I mean, let's be realistic. I don't know how people in Lagos survive. <laughs> Every day, four hours in traffic for five days. I don't know if Saturday and Sunday are enough for them to rest. That's why I feel that all those that have lived in Lagos for 20 years should just go straight to heaven because they have already lived in hell. <laughs> Honestly, they have paid their due, so they should just be given free pass, you know. Anyway, so, so for us, the four-day work week is working very well. There is no salary cut. Nothing. You have one extra day on your hands to catch up, to do this, to do that. And we're encouraging people to go back to school, you know, to take, you know, we have many universities and polytechnics in Cabinet State. Go and keep educating yourself, you know. So that Friday will help. And we will also be using Friday as the training day. You want, when you want to do internal training, seminars, and so on. We do that in Kaduna State Government. I know it's strange for some people, but we do seminars, we do brown bag uh, meetings, uh, you know, um, to share experiences and leadership uh, challenges. So yeah, it is working for us, um, but these are the challenges and we're working on them. When we have the full raft of regulations, Gazetted will be happy to share them with you. But we believe that the world is going in that direction. And where, why did we learn that? It was the experience of COVID-19. For 15 months, all employees of the Kaduna State Government below level 12 were not going to work. And they were being paid full salary. And the government was working. Then we realized that, do we really need these people? Um, but that, 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 that was another question. It convinced us that we can do more with less. And that coming to the four walls of an office are not necessarily, is not necessarily the only way to work. COVID forced us to recognize that. Luckily, you know, our technological platform as a government was quite advanced. So, you know, we, we were communicating, we were doing our work and, uh, and so on. So this is how the, the discussion started. And then when we realized that Finland was doing it, Denmark, you know, some American companies are doing it, UK is introducing it. We said, ah, Iceland has done it for years. France, we said, why not? Kaduna has always been the outlier. Let us try it. <laughs> we are the guinea pigs. Um, the question from Bloomberg, unfortunately, I cannot answer the question. I don't have the technical details. I am a leader at the political level. If I had come with the Commissioner uh, Business Innovation and Technology, he can reel out the numbers for you. All I know is that $600 million investment. Uh, on 143 hectares of land. Um, and this is what it looks like. What I would like to suggest if the State House uh, Press Corps agrees is we can arrange a tour, a visit to the facility before commissioning so that you meet, you know, first you tour the facility, you see what Ajakota could have been if we didn't go to Russians, bloody communists. Um, <laughs> And it's on Kaduna Abuja Highway. Uh, what is R? Ah? Hmm? See, Lagos man. The moment he say R, ah, you know, 
when I was doing my youth service, I was I served in Abekuta, and you see, you see someone say, I will finish you, I will damage you. The moment you slap him, he says, Ah, the fight is finished. <laughs> Kaduna Abuja Road is quite safe. I just gave you a brief of the number of security operations on the road. And don't worry, we will make sure you're protected on that day. But uh, I think it's something worth doing because I think it's a transformational moment for Nigeria's industrialization and everyone should be part of it and we should celebrate it more. And we'll be happy to arrange for you to go visit, tour, and ask them these questions. How much have you invested? How, ma how many tons are you producing? This, that, this. Because they say they have enough iron ore there to last them for like 30 years. Okay. So we'll be happy to arrange that because honestly, I don't have the details. I don't know whether you are somewhere. Do you know anything about? Yeah, we, can just we, organize. we don't. We can organize it. We'll be happy to do so. Um, name. Okay. How much have we spent on security? The last time we calculated in recurrent, that is security support to federal agencies and our own vigilance service and so on, we have spent close to 21 billion. Yes, yes, yes. But we are talking of seven years, okay? Um, the, in terms of capital investment, drones, um, safe city, uh, radio frequency, G GSM tracker, we bought our own. We don't rely on the NSA or the GSS, we have ours. Uh, we bought all this. The forensic lab, I think by the time we'll, we, we will be done is, I don't know, another 10, 10 12 billion. And uh, how much have we been reimbursed by the federal government? 100 million for the security operation we did in 2016. Um, so we, we, look, we are, not, uh, we, we are not talking about reimbursement or anything, but it is worth it if we are able to achieve full security. Um, we continue to invest in this. We don't count the cost of security. We just want to achieve full human security. That's what bothers us. Um, and then naming and shaming Boko Haram financiers. I, I'm, I'm sure there is a good reason for it. It's not about naming and shaming. Most of them have, are in custody. They are going to be tried. And uh, you need to be very careful how much you reveal before putting them on trial. Um, virtually all of them are in custody. I can assure you that. Because uh, the operation included my state, so I was being briefed at, as it was going on. Um, and we know, we know the names, we know everything, but what benefit is it? What shame is there when they are already in custody? They will be on trial soon, and their trial is likely to be public, so you will know them. But they are everywhere, including in Lagos and Port Harcourt. Everywhere, all over Nigeria. Um, but I am sure there is a good reason why uh, uh, Minister Lai Mohammed did not mention their names. And the reasons have to do with the fact that uh, they are going to be tried. Um, I think I have answered all the questions. Yes, debt profile of Kaduna state government. Well, you know, when we came into office, Kaduna is this, was the second most indebted state in Nigeria after Lagos. And we are still the second most indebted state. <laughs> we have not uh, even be close to Lagos. We have borrowed, yes. Every state has borrowed. In a time of recession, the only way to sustain growth is through borrowing. The people that are saying that the federal government uh, is borrowing forgot that the previous government enjoyed $100 a barrel oil price, squandered it all, and still borrowed, and did nothing with it. No infrastructure. No investment, all consumption, private jets. Nigeria had more private jets than any country on the continent. That's how the money went. Now you've taken over years of infrastructure deficit, years of 
on the investment in human capital. And every year we add 8 million babies and 5 million young people join the workforce. How are you going to deal with that? Just to maintain the levels of unemployment, we, met, we must create 5 million jobs every year. How do you deal with that? The only way to do it is to massively invest in infrastructure that will enable investments, that will enable investors to come in and put money and create those jobs that you need. This is what this government has been doing. It has been borrowing, yes. But you can see the results of the borrowing. Kaduna State Government has borrowed under my watch, yes. But go to Kaduna, you'll see it with your koro koro eyes. Before they were borrowing, the money ended up buying apartments in Dubai. Nothing in Kaduna. Today, property values in Kaduna are rising. People are building. Everybody wants to have a house in Kaduna because rents are rising. There is business activity. There is investment. Why? Because we've invested in infrastructure. And, would, and the loans will be paid back. How much is the debt profile? What are the numbers? I don't know off head. If I have come with the Commissioner of Budget and Planning, he can read out the numbers of foreign and domestic debt and what is our debt service and what is it. Yes, we have borrowed. But the results are there and the investments are flowing in and we will be fine by the grace of God. Thank you very much and God bless you. Question online. Yeah. One more question came online. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chooks OK is asking what is the role of CSOs in the success, successes recorded by your administration in Kaduna in the past six and a half years? Mike, okay. Civil society organizations have been major partners, frankly, in Kaduna, in every way, in virtually every facet, we try to engage and get inputs from civil society, from our budgeting, to our social protection plans, to virtually everything. The Open Government Partnership Committee, for instance, is co-chaired by someone from the government and someone from civil society. Uh, for sexual and gender-based violence, we engage actively with civil society. We are the first state to pass that uh, bill, uh, gender protection bill. We actively engage with them. In fact, in our Fiscal Responsibility Commission, we have the head of budget, Sheun Onigbinde, as a, one of the commissioners of our Fiscal Responsibility Commission. So we have civil society members on certain regulatory bodies of the Kaduna State Government so that they see what we are doing and they have their input. You know, they, are, they can be a nuisance sometimes, but the nuisance ones are the ones that are detached from the problem. For instance, a civil society organization that is in Kaduna knows what we are doing, okay? But you will hear Serap sitting in Ikeja writing, Kaduna State Government must give us this Freedom of Information Act. Come to Kaduna first. Our freedom of information law says you cannot ask us for information unless you are a resident of Kaduna State. We are only accountable to people in Kaduna, not to you. You can't sit in Lagos just because you want to impress donors and collect dollars and say you are fighting. You write me from Ikeja and say you want this from Kaduna. I'm not giving. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay? So, the, you know, when, when civil society, no, seriously, when civil society engages honestly, and they want to be helpful, they want to be partners, there is nothing better than that. But when they want to get headlines or donor money, they can be destructive. But we've not had that experience in Kaduna, because as I said, we know how to deal with the Lagos uh, uh, civil society, newspaper headlines, uh, uh, social media titans. Um, so I will recommend to everyone to engage very actively with their local civil society organizations. They are close to the people. They give you an alternative view. They give you a voice that helps make policies better. And we've never regretted you know, our partnership with budget and many other responsible civil society organizations. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. In our peace commission, for instance, we got civil. You know, we our revenue uh, board. We we have them because they are a good eye. They are a critical eye. And Samuel is reminding me that you know many of them we brought into the government to help. So yes. So Chooks, you know, civil society is good most of the time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please allow me to say a big thank you to. Governor Nasser al Rafai for this dazzling presentation, which is uh, factually very strong, statistically very rich, and, and pleasing and very sobering at the same time. You know, at the end of this, you don't know whether actually you'll be laughing or crying. You know, the security side of things is not as it should be, we're hoping that it continues to get better. Uh, you know, one of these dilemma tales that we learned from childhood, they asked you, how would you be crying and uh, laughing at the same time? And they said, uh, eat raw onions. And you laugh as you eat them, because the eyes will be dropping tears and you'll be laughing. I think the thing, the lesson from all of these things is that while the government has a problem, there's a crisis in the state, the government is not putting all of their attention on one thing. They can do more than one thing at a time. There can still be development as they are dealing with, with the a situation of uh, insecurity as we have. We thank you very much for making it out there. And I ask uh, you, the correspondents, the leadership, to please take seriously his invitation to Kaduna. If I recall very well, I think it's, the Kaduna is the only state that had hosted the, the, this chapel uh, on a retreat some years back. Yes. I think it's not a bad idea to repeat it. I was there myself, and I think it was quite uh, an experience. So we thank uh, my colleagues on the presidential communications team. O Oge, thank you very much. She's a back injury room person, really, with the Uche, and, and thank you. Uh, Colonel Felix, this is security, our own beat. I've seen Loretta. Barista Aliu Abdullah from Madame. Uh, who else do I miss? Tolu Ogulesi. Yes, and Barista Ismail, I don't know. I, even the party is represented at this bridge. So, <laughs> so we, we thank you, everyone, for being patient and for having waited. And by the way, Leon, which secondary school did you attend? Dr. Leon, which secondary school did you attend? No, no. <laughs> Because, because he has mentioned Barewa, and I want to say that uh, this, is, this is the stuff of Barewa College. I don't know whether anyone had been to King's College here, because there are rivals, CKC, Onicha, Ibadan, GCI. These are the ones. You, you know, the, the amazingly successful head of service we have, Fola Shadi, now. She didn't attend Barewa College. She grew up in the premises. She was raised in the compound of the principal, who was the first uh, Nigerian principal of Borea College anyway. So that's the stuff. Thank you, Governor Anasuri <laughs> Have a nice day. Thank you. Oh. 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 Oh.